When you've served multiple terms as a U.S. Senator, after a while I think it's natural for the people of your state to think of you as a U.S. Senator, kind of first, second, and third. But as you all know, I suspect, the Senator had a long political career in the state legislature and of course as Attorney General before he became a U.S. Senator. And he had 12 years as Attorney General and that's the focus of this symposium, is the focus on the 12 years that the Senator had uh, as Attorney General uh, here in the, uh, in the state of Washington. The key thing was that Slade was a lawyer's lawyer. The fact that his first priority was to really get to know people tells you a lot about him. I don't think he ever asked anyone if they were a Republican or a Democrat. He just wanted talented people. That's all that mattered. And, and, and others told me the same thing. Ed Mackey, Phil Austin, Charlie Rowe. Uh, you really had a remarkable staff. And I, I think I O'Connell, to his credit, had, had, had yeah. nurtured a really group, good group of people, hadn't he? He had. Yeah. He had. There was plenty of time to think you know, on, you know, on, on that trip, and it was Watergate summer. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that, uh, that, that the case against Nixon was irrefutable. And so in the speech, even though that was the next winter, I believe that I only made statements that were not disputed. You know, much was still going on in that dispute at the time. And just think, if we just accept what everyone knows and agrees to, He's forfeited his right to be president. Whether I would have gone through that long thought process had I been doing office things every day, rather than going across the whole United States and, and uh, giving my children an adventure they didn't want was, was still was the, one of the greatest things they'd ever have in their, in, in their lives. Uh, I, I'm not at all sure. But there was plenty of time to think away from newspapers, away from television, uh, and just what was the future of the country going to be like. Tell us about how you prepared for the daunting experience of having nine of the smartest people on earth parse your ever utterance when you're standing <laughs> up there with your quill. What did you Every do? Every time we had uh, treasurer granted and, and had an argument scheduled, I would go back to Washington, D.C. a good three days, maybe even four days, before the argument was to take place and would take two to four of my assistant or deputy attorneys general with me, ones who knew something about, about the case itself. And I have a tactile memory, so I would write out an argument, sometimes in full, or at least all of the points that I wanted to make on a long yellow legal pad, and uh, then have the assistants in to present it and present it as if I were the oral argument and, and, and they were the court. And encourage them, as a matter of fact, demanded of them that they interrupt me, that they ask questions, that they come up with the toughest questions that they possibly could. And I'd answer them as well as I could and was never satisfied with my answers the first time around. Shoo them out of the room, rewrite the argument, do the same thing again, do the same re response again, write it a third or fourth time. Basically, by the time I had written my argument with all of the necessary changes in it four or five times, I hardly needed to look at it to be able to, to, uh, to, to get through it. And presenting the cases, I wanted it to, uh, to, to, to be presented. And incidentally, one reason that I ended up thinking uh, that uh, I could do a much better job at this than one of the people who had been with the case for four or five or six years was that I was looking at the case much more like that Supreme Court Justice was looking at it, who had maybe read it the, you know, the, the, the week before and the like, and could get closer into their, their minds and what they were thinking and, uh, and, and, and what they were asking. And so the best of all of my arguments, and I don't even remember which of those cases it was, but it was toward the end, maybe the 10th or 11th of them, Every question I got asked by a Supreme Court justice was the next point in the outline. Wow. And I felt, I, felt, you know, I felt quite good about that one. I never felt in any of the 14 that I had said all I needed to say mm. or all I wanted to say. There was always something that gnawed at me. That, mm. now, why, didn't, why didn't you do such and such or say such and such? Mm. But uh, you got to know the varying personalities of the members of the court quite well the worst start anyone ever had in arguing in front of the Supreme Court, which was namely me. Tell us all about it. <laughs> the first case I argued was an Indian case, not fish, 
but that the demand of the state of Washington that Indian smoke shops charge the tobacco tax, the big tobacco mm -hmm. tax, and sales from those Indian smoke shops to non-Indians. And the Indians, of course, the smoke shops were making a lot of money because they could sell tobacco products way cheaper uh, than anyone else could. And it arose out of the Yakima Reservation. Mm -hmm. So I, thinking that here are this bunch of Eastern Harvard and Yale lawyers on the court whose idea of an Indian reservation comes from a John Wayne movie, uh, I start out by saying, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the Yakima Indian Reservation extends from the Cascade Mountains to the thread of the Yakima River. 80% of its population is non-Indian, and in fact, it includes two incorporated cities, Davinish and Wapato. Justice Douglas leaned over the bench and said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> he came from of Yakima. Of course, yeah. He knew every square mile. He came yeah. from Yakima. He's 100% wrong, I'm 100% right, and who the hell are we going to believe? <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. I think this is going to be a really fun panel about one remarkable aspect of uh, Senator Gordon's career as Attorney General, and that is the many, many cases he argued at the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm just going to give a very brief sort of overview, and then, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, so General Gordon argued, I think, a total of 14 cases at the Supreme Court, including 12 in the course of six years between 1974 and 1980. And just to give a sense of how remarkable that is uh, and also how much things have changed, so he was doing roughly two cases every year. Uh, over the last three years at the Supreme Court, all attorneys general across the whole country uh, have argued themselves a total of two cases in the last three years. Uh, and, and General Gordon was doing that uh, basically every year for six years. You know, I told the story about my disaster with my, my first statement about the, the nature of the Yakima the, the Indian Reservation. If that had been my 10th argument, I suspect I probably would have taken on Justice Douglas on it. But it seemed to me to be absolutely pointless to try to do that as, a, as, as, as someone brand new. You're playing in the World Series at Yankee Stadium. Uh -huh. And uh, you want, of course, very badly to win. You also, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want them to be able to ask you a question that you have never thought of before. And sometimes I succeeded at that, and there were times when I didn't succeed at, uh, at, 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 at that. But it's just uh, any time a lawyer goes into court, that lawyer is going to have a certain increase in, a, in, in adrenaline. Your, your attention is going to be uh, more sharp. Uh, uh, your <coughs> time either goes too fast or too, sl or, 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 or too slowly. But I, I think. My, my main concern when I went to the Supreme Court is do it right. You know, get your case across. Get these people uh, to understand, you know, to un understand why you're on the right side and why they should come up. And this, maybe I disagree with others. I didn't care much about their rationale. I cared about the you know, the, the, you know the, the bottom line result. Uh, and how do, you, how do you persuade them that you're right? If you're right, you can find a legal basis for it. Any tips on arguing uh, uh, for a first time, for a first time advocate at the, at the US Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay. On that note, uh, did you have any lucky socks or anything that you wore when you, uh, or uh, any, any, you know, well, always knock on the door on the way in or anything? Just make that you... sure you're, you're, you're well prepared. As okay. Sure you will. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Senator. My name is Eric Kiyula, and I'm a Deputy Attorney General with the office, and it's my honor to be here and part of this discussion today. Pretty good. During my first two terms as Attorney General, Dan Evans was governor. We were close friends, and it was a close personal relationship. He was succeeded by Dixie Lee Ray. Dixie Lee Ray intensely disliked lawyers, Republicans, and <laughs> friends of Dan Evans. <laughs> and I qualified on all three counts. And one of the first bills she had introduced in the legislature was to remove from the attorney general's jurisdiction all assistant attorneys general who represented uh, uh, agencies of the state and, ha and ha have them subject to the governor's authority. In other words, probably cutting 
three quarters or 80% of the work of the Attorney General uh, away from the Attorney General itself. I'll tell you, I panicked. <laughs> uh, there were Democratic majorities in both houses of the, uh, of, uh, of the legislature at that point. And this was a major threat, and even looking at it objectively would have been a terrible policy. If your team senses any daylight between what is doing the right thing for the office and the people and the politically expedient thing, you're never getting their respect back. You just won't. I mean, w once you make that decision yourself, what's going to stop you the next time from making the easier decision or the one after that? I just, it has to be a bright line, I think. And I think that's why the AG's office in Washington State has such a great reputation nationwide over so many decades is I, I think, you know, my predecessors have really stuck to that. Whether individuals in the state agree with them personally or not on their decisions, I think it came from a place of trying to represent the state uh, in an independent fashion. The role of the attorney general is a very important one and that it is unique uh, among elected, uh, elected officers. It, it, it's, although we don't see that in the last couple of national administrations, it's unique at the level of the Attorney General of the United States, too, who, while he's appointed by the President and serves at his pleasure, nonetheless is the enforcer of the law and is, is sworn to do it uh, you know, ob objectively and uh, without uh, political motivation to the maximum possible extent. And that's, uh, that, that, that's one of the, I think, one of the elements that unites the three of us. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful position because in connection with many controversies, you're, you're, you're above the ground. It isn't, they, they aren't uh, partisan political decisions that you make. And as long as you can, and Bob has put this very well, as long as you can justify them in your own mind, you're in fine shape. There are some, some decisions that you make that have such wide impact that you really want to consult fairly broadly uh, before, you decide, before you decide to go, to head, go ahead. None of us is omniscient by any stretch of the imagination, and we can't anticipate all of the consequences of the decisions we make. But others, like mine, I, I guess mine on gambling, just you know, come from your own character and your own uh, your, your own approach, and you're willing to decide to take them on if you feel it's the right thing to do, and deal with the consequences and just and do do your best to justify them, and if you can't justify them to yourself, you're not going to be able to justify them to others, so some of them die a warning. But uh, one of the great advantages of the Attorney General's office is when you decide something ought to happen, you can make it happen. You let everyone you're working with know that you're not just waiting for them to agree with what you already decided. Uh, and to encourage uh, and really even require a spirited discussion and debate around the tough issues in, in, in the group, whether it's a group of lawyers in a particular division or it's the deputy attorneys general and the solicitor general. I think it's important as a leader to empower the folks who are your closest advisors and most senior advisors to know they can disagree with you and they can disagree with each other, and that's all fine. Uh, and even uh, if, I'm, if I'm espousing a particular view, I might just be trial ballooning it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be contradicted and I want to hear it. So the best way to get to the right decision, in my view, is to have that, have that discussion and that debate so you're airing all sides. I mean, there have been famous executives, famous presidents who have actually assigned responsibilities. You're going to be the blue team, you're going to be the red team. Come give me the best arguments on both sides of the issue. That ought to be what happens. Now, given the volume of decision making, it can't always happen. And at some point, I came to the conclusion that you have to get as much as you can. Time is limited. You ask as many questions as you can, but you know, I, I, I try to just trust my instincts. You know, that's, I don't know another way to put it. On some level, we are who we are. We got where we are. Whatever combination of life experiences got us here, and, and I just think uh, I try to just trust my instincts. And if a member of my team who I trust says, wait a second on those instincts, I'm going to revisit that, okay, um, and think carefully about it. But uh, for me, I think in a nutshell, that, that's how it goes. But I do have one more question, and that is for Senator Gordon. As everyone knows, we are here to honor the 50th year since your election to Attorney General, but also to celebrate your 90th birthday. And so I wonder, do you have a special birthday wish for your 90th birthday? Yes, <laughs> <Just> 91. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. 
Happy birthday, dear Slade. Happy birthday to you. Thank you.